are going to get into some proper wood carving today. What we're going to be doing is carving a spoon, similar to one of these right here. These are both made out of walnut. We're going to be carving walnut today. But before we get into any of that, I should say, if you have any questions about the tools that you see throughout this whole video, go ahead and leave those questions down in the comments. And if you're interested in the work, such as the spoon we're carving, you can check out our Etsy shop. We're going to post a link to that in the description, so go ahead and check that out as well. Anyways, back to uh, the spoon here. These are both carved out of walnut. There's a bunch of different woods you can use. Too much to explain right now. The best way to explain it is to go ahead and jump right into it. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so the wood that we are going to be selecting a piece from today is walnut. That's what we have, these logs we got here. So you don't have to use walnut. Walnut's a good piece. It makes a good product. But you can use cherry or some sycamore, sassafras, or maple. Or, you know, there's quite a few good woods. But today we're going to be using walnut because that's what we have. Now, when you're carving anything by hand, what you're trying to find as far as selecting a piece of wood goes is you want to find a straight grain piece with no knots of any kind. The knots will give you a really cool grain structure, but they'll also make your finished product really weak and it will make it really, really challenging to carve whatever it is you're trying to carve the entire time. So to avoid knots, you'll be way more successful in doing that. So you can see on this particular piece of wood we have here, there's a big burl right here and there's a big knot right here. So we're going to cut that off and get back to where we can find a nice clear piece. Now, Another thing I should mention is I see on YouTube in different spoon carving videos that people will be carving spoons out of like dried two by fours or something like that. And that is pretty much exactly what you don't want to do. When, when you go to carve a spoon or hand carve anything, you want to start with green wood. Green wood carves way easier, which gives you a huge advantage. And when you're carving by hand, you need all the advantage that you can get. It's going to be hard enough as it is. So selecting a piece of green wood is where you want to start. The green wood ensures that you don't have any checks or anything like that when you start. That the, the dry wood already had time to like unstabilize and there's likely to be checks in the end and so you'll get halfway through your project and just to find that you have checks and that's incredibly disappointing. So starting with green wood you're going to be way more successful. So let's go ahead and cut the end of this off and see if we can't get us a clear piece and uh, split into it and see what we can find. So how we're going to get our spoon blank out of this piece of wood is we're going to split it. That's going to be the most effective way. And take a closer look up here. This is, this is pretty important. You have the center of the tree. The center of the tree has these wind marks, has these uh, checks, and they're always in every piece of wood. So you don't ever want to leave the center of the piece of wood in anything you're carving ever. You want to get rid of that. So we're going to split from here over and select our blank out of this side. So you can see we have that, that, that good check already formed. We're going to start by using that as our direction to start our score. And that will help us become more successful at gaining control and getting this to split off really easy. So you want to start right there. Just follow that wind mark and bust the side off. So I'm going to score it right along here to encourage the split to happen right where we want it to. So that way we can maximize the amount of spoon blanks that we get out of this one piece because we want to get as many as we can. So you can see that split exactly where we wanted it.
Okay, so now we have our possible spoon blanks here that we selected from that log. Let's, let's take a close look at them so you can see what we're actually looking for in a spoon blank. This right here, you can see that squirrely grain right there. And you can see some bumps right there where some knots. This is going to haunt you the entire time. This piece of wood is no good. That is firewood. So now we're down to two. This one right here has some squirrely grain. Yeah, it straightens up back here a little bit, and you could get the bowl down here. This is, you can carve this. I'm going to save this for later to carve. Now this piece right here is the best one out of all of them. We have the pith from the center of the tree, but we'll go ahead and cut that off. So this is the one we're going to select, and the reason why we selected it is clear, because you can see that's nice and straight, and this is going to haunt us the whole time. So this will be a much more successful piece of wood to carve. So we're going to start with this one. So now that we have our spoon blank selected, to start carving the spoon, you have to draw the spoon out. And it's going to be too hard to draw on this because it's all gnarly because we just split it and there's still some splinters and stuff left on here and some sap, wood, and bark. So we're going to true this up and we're going to make it nice and flat on all sides so we get rid of all like checks and splinters and we're just down to a solid piece of wood that we know we can count on. So let's go ahead and true this up. Now you can see I make these scores right here. That enables all of this wood to come off of there a lot easier. If you just start from the top and come down, your hatch will just get stuck every time. And it just takes too much energy to get nowhere. So if you make those nice scores, you're more successful. You'll notice throughout this whole video, we're going to approach it the same way every time by making those nice scores. So when you're true enough your piece of wood, you don't have to spend all day long making it exactly perfect. That would be a waste of time. But you do need to do a good enough job to where you can draw on it reasonably effectively without having to go over like bumps and splits. And you need to get back down to nothing but clear, solid wood so you know what you actually have to work with. And you'll notice here that there's no propeller twist. So one end of the board is not like this and one is not like that. It's pretty much straight all the way through because we got rid of the propeller twist so we know what we actually have. So that's what you're trying to do is just clean it up so you can draw a picture on it. So before you go to draw anything on your blank, make sure to look it over thoroughly and uh, assess both ends and that will help you make the decision of which way you want to put your spoon on it. Bowl down here versus bowl up here. Now this particular piece I looked it over and I decided to put the bowl down here and the handle up here because up on this end, there's that from the center of the tree, that, that, that check, there's still a little bit of it over here, but that's going to be beside the handle, so it won't affect us negatively. But if we were to put the bowl on this end of the spoon, that would be right across the edge of our bowl. That would be a disaster. So we're going to put the handle here and the bowl down here. Another reason why we chose to do this is because the blank is wider at this end. That's going to give us a bigger bowl, which will make the spoon capable of more and bring more value. So that's why we selected that, and let's go ahead and draw it on here. Before I start drawing on here, I am going to kind of bring you up to speed with what's going on. It'll help you track along better. You won't be sailing so blind, so to speak. So here we go. You have a few basic differences in spoons. I'm going to use these two right here as an example. You'll notice this handle right here starts out small and tapers continuously to slightly larger towards the end, where this one starts out small and tapers up to larger right here, then tapers back into smaller. That's one of the differences here. This one has a round bowl, and this one here has an egg-shaped bowl. So today the spoon we're going to be carving is going to have a round bowl, because I think with this big blank right here, it's going to make most sense and best be used for this. And it is going to have a handle that tapers like this. So it's going to look very similar to this. And so now that you know this is kind of what we're going for, a slightly larger version of this as we're explaining things and laying it out, you can kind of uh, brace yourself to see this actually coming out of the wood. So let's go ahead and lay it out. Another thing here about layout. So when, when you're building 
anything in the world, doesn't matter what it is, you're better off to start with an idea of what you want it to look like when you're done. If you don't quite have that worked out, you're not going to be very effective with your energy delivery. Your energy delivery is always going to be like, I'm not sure, am I going too far, is this right, I don't really know. So if you start with an idea of what you really want and you lay it out exactly, like geometrically specific, perfect, then you can just direct your energy right to that line every time and you'll be way more successful. So let's go ahead and start with a real perfect layout that we can go directly to as opposed to imagining what we possibly might want it to look like someday. So when you are laying out whatever it is you're going to lay out, you're always best to start from center. That way, both sides of whatever it is you're building looks the same. So we have walnut and we're going to mark with a black pencil and that's going to be really challenging for you to see. So I apologize for that. But uh, so we're going to start by putting the handle on here. So we start by making us a center line. I'm going to try to make these real dark so you can see them. A half inch off to either side of the center. And, you know, we're just so far back from the end of the spoon because our handle is going to taper up wide and then taper in again. So you can put that wherever you want to in this location. That is up to you. So now we're going to go back down here to where the bowl end of the spoon is. And again, we're going to start with a center line and then a quarter inch off to either side. And we are going to make these lines here nice and dark as possible. So hopefully you'll be able to see them on the video. The center line is your control line. This is an important line. Make this one really dark because you're going to use it quite a few times. All right, so that is both sides of the handle. Hopefully you can see that. And now... We're going to the other end of the handle, a quarter inch off to either side of the line. You don't have to follow a quarter inch or half inch. You can make it whatever you want uh, because you might want your handle a little fatter or a little thinner. That choice is up to you. So this is, that is the beginning of our spoon layout right there. Now we're gonna lay out the bowl and because we chose this round bowl, it's really easy to lay out. And to lay out the round bowl, you use a compass. That is really, really easy to do. What you want to do is when you start your radius, you know, you want to be, be realistic about what you have here because you can see that piece of wood kind of angles out to the side. So you can't lay out all the way to the top because you don't have that. You got to come back in a little bit. So let's go from our center control line out there and let's uh let's bring that in a little bit so we know we actually have what we think we have. Check it on the other side, we're good over here. But you want to start your circle from right here on the end. You don't want to start it back. If you start back, it's going to make your hatchet work way harder. So start it all the way from the end right there. Make that good and dark. Hopefully you can see that. Another thing I should have explained earlier is there is this style of spoon too. So this one has this direct transition where the handle comes into the bowl and this one has this flow in. You often see these flow ins and the reason is, is because they're way easier to carve, but that's not the spoon we're carving today. If you were to carve a spoon and you were like a beginner carver, this would be way easier to do. And if you were gonna do that, at that point you want to draw this round in here just by using any sort of round thing just like that and making you a line on it like that blah 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 same thing on the other side that'll give you that flow in but we're not going to carve one of those flow ins today we're going to carve this direct transition so let's go ahead and head over the chopping block and start cutting this sucker out so to remove all of the wood outside of this line the tool we're going to use is a hatchet and we're going to start with this one right here. Now, all my tools are good and sharp. So 
Sharpening tools is going to be a video for another day, but when you're carving, we'll get to this later. Right now, I'm just going to take my word for it, but you'll see me using this strop all the time, and I'll say it over and over, strop often, because it just brings your hatchet or your tool, whatever you're using, right back to peak performance. So definitely strop often. All my tools are already sharpened, so I don't have to worry about sharpening them right now. I just gotta like hone them back up to peak performance real quick with this strop. So now that I'm right back on top, we're ready to go. So when you remove this wood around through here, what you want to keep in mind is, you wanna think, for lack of a better term, you want to imagine that you've put it on a bandsaw and you've cut 90 degrees from the top surface, 90 degrees all the way around and you want it to look 90 degrees and you have to be honest with yourself about that because when you're carving a spoon or carving anything you're doing more than one thing at a time one thing is you're carving but the other thing is you're training your eye to be able to see what it is you're actually doing and uh, don't be unrealistic about that because it is it's harder to see impurities than you think and so how we're going to carve the spoon it's going to make it easy for your eye to go to the impurities and easy for you to fix and remedy the impurities because we're going to make it really visible how to do that. So anyways, so uh, I have this square and I'm going to make a mark on the end of this spoon. Now when I'm carving spoons all day, I don't make these marks because I don't need to because my eye is already trained. But I'm going to make them here because I'm going to use them as references to better explain what I just made an attempt to explain. But trust me, here in a bit, it's going to make more sense. So I'm going to start to remove all this wood, and this is going to be our reference mark to see if we're actually 90 when we get down there. Okay, we're about to grab the hatchet and start removing this wood. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make scores that go all the way directly to my line. And these pieces of wood are gonna pop off of there and it's gonna be pretty efficient. But what enables me to be efficient and direct my energy is because I took the time to do a proper layout. And I'm not at all, no, none of my energy is being absorbed by second guessing my layout because I know that layout's right. So I'm not gonna sit there going, is that right? I don't really know. And then each one of my strokes being directed with this insecurity. No, it's gonna be directed with absolute intention directly to the line, and that is gonna aid in my ability to be much more efficient. So that's why it's important to do a proper layout. So let's go ahead and, and get into this scoring here. So this first cut is pretty important. Okay, so on that first cut, now let's go ahead and flip it around to see if it lines up to that 90 degree mark. I can't see from here, but I'm imagining my eye can see 90 from this other angle. So let's take a look. And you can see it's a little higher back here, but not bad. I'm not terribly off. If you get this line way off, the end of your handle is going to be sticking to one side or the other, and that'll be terrible looking. So you don't want that. Okay, so that's pretty good. So I'm going to kind of use that as my sight reference from this stage on. I'm about an inch and three quarter from my last cut and those pieces are just going to split off of there really effectively and I'm going to I'm going to do that same thing over and over up through here stepping back, back about an inch and three quarter each time and when I get down to my line it's important that I keep this hatchet cut 90 to there then I'm going to step back halfway I'm going to score it one more time right down to the line another inch and three quarters step halfway and score it again again another inch and three quarters you can see that wood coming off of there really effectively and reliably step back and score it now this cut you have to slow down just a little bit on so I'm gonna follow right around that line
And this is a live, unedited shot right here of how long it takes you to do one side. Okay, I'm right down to my mark. Now, now see, I'm imagining that I can see 90 degrees right here. So if you're not good at seeing 90 degrees, get a, a square and check it. But stay 90, that's really, really important. And you wanna cut right down that line. Now, we're gonna see just how 90 I really am. And I'm not 100%. You see how that's wider back there than up here? No big deal. I'll true that up. That is another thing you have to practice while you're spoon carving, is being honest with yourself. Anyways, so now that I have that, I'm gonna flip it around here and cut on down into there. You won't be able to see the line from here, from, the, from your view but I still want to show you how it's supposed to look when you're doing it. You want to slow your chops down a little bit because you don't want to hack right into the side of your bowl. But we've already made this cut right here scored all the way to the line. So these wood chips should, within reason, come off pretty reliably. Now these cuts you don't want to overrun. You have to stop right there. You don't want to hack in there and, and overrun. Just leave that be. Okay, so that's one side of the handle roughed out. So let's go ahead and do the other side. All right, we're gonna work on the other side of the spoon now and take the other side down. It's gonna look very similar to what we did here, but I'm gonna do it slightly different. Anyways, before we get started, there is one thing that I should definitely say. Okay, so I carve spoons all the time. This is what we make a living doing. Long story short, carving is incredibly dangerous and using sharp hatchets and sharp anything is really, really, really dangerous. And so you have to really be careful when you're doing this. One of the mistakes everybody makes, and you will make this mistake, because everyone makes this mistake. When you go to hold your spoon blank and you go to chop on it, your first instinct is gonna to be to like, I need to hold this spoon blank really, really hard. And the best way to hold it really stable is to put your hand on top of it because that's the best place to hold it for stability. But the worst place to hold it for safety because it puts all your hand and all your fingers right on the top. So when you're chopping, you can miss a stroke and bang, come right down on the top of it and it'll just pop your finger directly right off just completely super easy. So you have to continuously remind yourself to not hold it up here. Never put any fingers over the top of any kind. Always hold it on the side. Because on the side, if you overstroke or something, you're not gonna hit your fingers. And if you were to miss a cut or miss a chop, you would hit your hand and it would draw your hand down and cut your hand really, really bad. It would be awful, but it would be less likely to cut your fingers straight off. So never hold the block of wood on the top. Always hold it down here on the side. Another thing, don't be doing any like wild chops at your legs. Keep your, you know, keep real stable. You'll notice all the time, I have my knee up here and my block of wood's really stable. You'll never see me in this position, like out here, like a wild boy scout. Never do that. Always keep lots of stability. My, my elbow's in tight. That's my pivot point right here. So I can return to the same spot every time. And so, a lot of this technique is really, really important. Probably not going to have time to explain all of it in this video, but remember, the most important thing is never put your hand on top of the piece of wood while you're carving. You'll chop your fingers off. Always keep it over here. So on this side of the spoon here, you notice my chops went directly to the line. Super efficient, really, really good. If you feel capable of doing that, some of you will be capable, some of you won't be capable because some of you It'll be your first time picking up a hatchet. So I don't recommend doing that on your first time. So what I'm gonna do over here on this other side is I'm gonna make those scores coming into halfway. That way I have a chance to chop that off and practice getting that good flow. Now, if I can't get that good flow here, chances are when I get to my mark, I'm also not gonna be able to get that good flow. So that's why I'm gonna just chop my scores in halfway and it's gonna give me a time to, a chance to practice before I get to my line. 
I want to only do it once here. In a super beginner situation, you might want to just make your scores a little bit. That'll give you multiple times to practice getting that good flow and check in that 90 before you actually get to the line because you don't want to get to that line and find out that you're just you're you're not capable of getting that flow because your project or your project will be over at that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to you know take a half step here and then I'm going to practice getting a flow and showing you how to do that because if you're a beginner, you would definitely want to pursue it that way. So let's flip it around and start. So I'm going to make these chops this time halfway in. Halfway to the line. You won't be able to see the line because the line's on the other side of the spoon. Now, I'm going to practice getting a flow off of here. I can see the line from my side of the wood. You won't be able to from, from your side. but uh, So now I'm just going to practice getting a nice flow. Because you will need to be able to do that. And it's much better to practice in a consequence-free area right here than rather than when you get down to the line. So you can see I made that, that nice flow there. And so I, it shows that I have control. And another thing we can check too is how close to being able to eyeball 90 are we. And you can see that's pretty close. So when you make your first pass, put a square on it and check, and you'll find you're not that 90. But it's important to train your eye to see what 90 is. And, and where everybody gets tempted is they, they are so eager to get to the line, so they get to the line on the face of the spoon over here, on the back side of the spoon, they're still way up here. And so their, their line will be like cut at a diagonal like that because they just want to get to that line. Don't be tempted by that. There's no shortcutting. You have to take the whole thing at once. Don't just take the face. Anyways, I'm going to finish up this cut. So some of these spots working in around the, the bowl here, getting down to the handle, you do have to get creative, get some different positions. But always worry about this 90 right here. Always worry about that 90 degrees from the surface. You get chopping towards the bowl you want to go real slow because you don't want to overrun and split the side of your bowl off you don't even want to fracture that wood at all so you want to go really slow in this location right here these cuts can't override at all they have to barely meet so be real gentle with that so let's take a look at our 90 on the end of the handle here and see how close we are. We're, we're paralleling that line, I would say, almost exactly. And so that's really close. We've already like distorted the other side from using that as our bearing point, but it's important to get that part of the handle right. Otherwise it'll stick off to one side or the other and you just won't like it. And so very important to keep this 90 all the way down through this. You can see that's a pretty good flow. So now we're gonna tune up the front of the spoon right here. You want to go slow at first and as we work our way around to the front right here you would think that you just take this and chop that right off and get rid of that curl immediately you don't want to do that because where the hatchet lands right down here in this crease that makes a dark shadow and that dark shadow enables your eye to go directly to it and it can reference or aid in your ability to reference that 90 off of the surface so don't just pop that peel off of there. You want that dark shadow as your bullseye. That's what you're aiming for. Now, a lot of those peels are going to pop off on their own. But you want to maintain that dark crease. You can see I'm maintaining that dark crease. That, it, that's my target. That's what I'm going for every time. Not only is it my target, but it's my sight reference. So as you're carving, you're always trying to create these sight references because that aids in your ability to actually see what it is you're doing. And it makes it more possible for you to visualize or to reference the impurities and correct them as you go. All right. Well, I did the same thing here to the other side. You won't be able to see the line from there. 
But again, I'm starting that, that peel, and I'm landing my hatchet in it every time, and I'm starting that dark crease as my visual reference. That's the only thing that allows me to see that 90 degrees and to have a target to aim for with my hatchet every time. Everyone does the same thing here too. They, they get in a hurry and they carve at an angle to the line and they think, oh, I'm almost done but they miss the entire back half. You can't do that. You have to start with the 90 and keep that 90 continued all the way around. Okay, so there's a lot to explain in design and wood carving and layout. I'm not gonna be able to cover it all in this video. I'll just, I'll kind of scratch the surface and shine a little light right on the corner of what we're talking about. So. When we're carving this spoon, we are going to work one dimension at a time. So you can see we laid it out and we cut out this one dimension. You can just see the one dimension this way. We're not caring about yet. Only this way and that 90 degrees. Very important. I'm sure you're sick of hearing me say 90 degrees, but really important to always make sure that all of this is 90 degrees from the surface. Okay, so when you work one dimension at a time, you cultivate these crisp ridges. Now these crisp ridges are what enables your eye to see any impurities. And that's why even on the video, you can see that there is some pretty good flow to this. And I'm sure if there's a hump or a bump somewhere, you'll be able to see it on the video because of those sight ridges are allowing your eye to see it. Now, if we had to work three dimensionally, all that would have been rounded off and you wouldn't have been able to see as easily that direct rigid, that sight ridge right there. So that's why we work one dimension at a time because we're trying to cultivate those sight ridges. It, it enables our eye to see more accurately what we're actually looking at. So now that we have this first dimension done, we're going to add the second dimension. We're going to add the rocker to our bowl and the flow to our handle. So let's go ahead and draw that on here. So when we laid out the top of the spoon, we did a specific geometric perfect layout. And we went directly to that. So these are all control lines right here. These are all control lines. Now on the side of the spoon, we're not going to have the same ability to geometrically lay it out. So we're going to have to use our ability to, to draw and cr to create and, and, uh, and achieve a good flow. Now a good flow is very important. So we're going to draw these. These are these are control lines. These are reference lines, what we're drawing. The reference line is much different than a control line because it's only a reference, which means you don't have to actually follow it. I know that sounds confusing, but it actually makes sense. Okay, so we don't have the ability to, or the advantage to put a batten on here and draw this line exactly what we need to do. And we're not going to lay out both sides. We're only going to lay out one side. That's what makes these reference lines. That's the rocker to our bowl, and this is going to be the flow to our handle. These are reference lines. Hopefully you can see, as I'm drawing this, the black on the walnut. I'm sure it's not that visible. You want, to, you want to make sure that this cut is fairly smooth. You can see I have that right there and this right here. I'm just being honest about the poor job I did right there. But you don't want to take so long on this because that's unrealistic too. But you want to make it smooth enough to where you can draw on it. So that is our handle. And that is the rocker to our bowl. You don't need to put the secondary line in there, but I'm going to do it anyways just so you are more comfortable with seeing it. Okay, so these are just hand scribbled uh, reference lines. So now let's go ahead and start by cutting the rocker on this bowl. Okay, so when I'm cutting the rocker on this bowl, what I wanna do is start by making a score right here because I don't want my overrun chops to continue to split into our handle and damage our handle. So I'm gonna make a score right here so these 
cuts from our rocker on our bolt will, will flake off better. So you'll see, I'll turn this way. Cutting the straight end. You don't want to overdo this either because that will come and mess up the back of the bowl. So I'm cutting the straight end here. And I'm just getting somewhere down there close to the handle with that score line. Okay. Now, bracing it on my knee. Finding a good place on the chopping block here that won't keep slipping out. I can feel my hatchet losing performance, so I'm going to strop it again. Bring it right back to the peak performance. Always strop often. Now this is a hard cut to make. Again, notice how my hands are down on the, on the sides, not on the top, way down on the sides. Go slow on these chops. You're not gonna save the world with one of them. It's gonna, it's gonna take you a while on this. The problem is like as you carve the spoon, each step gets harder and harder as you go. The beginning is the easiest part. <laughs> it only gets harder from there. Don't take over wild chops and then and split your handle. That's why I'm leaving those curls to prevent that. So you can see I made it down to my line there. Now I have to cut the center out right there. And when I do that, you don't want to keep like messing this top cut up and bang, bang, keep working down. You'll destroy your project. So go really slow on this entrance cut right here. Really slow. This is a hard one to get. And these are reference lines, which means you don't need to follow them. You might... I find that when I'm carving with the hatchet, I have more control with the hatchet than I do with the pencil on the wood. I can see better the flow coming from the hatchet than I can the flow coming from the pencil. So unlike the surface, like when we drew the first dimension on the spoon, that was a complete, you know, total geometric layout. These, these are not, these are just references. So, so you, you're, you're doing more sight work here and less following the line. So when you get that first cut, you know, you can see, this is a good example. I did not follow my line because I don't really like my line. That's gonna put too much rocker. So I just made that cut. And I like the way that cut looks better. But you'll notice that that cut is not higher on one side than on the other. And you need to take painstaking effort to look at that and be honest and see if it's higher or lower because that needs to be exactly the same on both sides. In other words, 90 from the side. And that's why it's so critical to keep all this because it aids in your ability to cite what we're even talking about now. Anyways. Now we're going to surface out the top flow of that handle. So I'm going to make me a score right here to cut down to that line. Now I'm right down to that line. Start back here. Don't get going too fast because you'll overcut bang and cut right into the back of your bowl and ruin your, your whole project. Again, you don't have to follow that line that you drew, but you can if you want. That's up to you. Depends on how good you drew it. But from my, my perspective, I can sight right down this handle. I can follow this sight ridge that I'm can, creating, and, and I feel like I have a better vantage point than I did when I was drawing it with a pencil. So I can see the flow a lot better from right here and control it better with my hatchet than I can with the pencil. We're gonna not worry too much about this area because you don't wanna do, use too big of a tool for too small of a job. Now we're gonna surface out the back of this handle. You can see I'm gonna start making these scores light here. If I make them too deep, it's gonna go pop off my uh, the hook part of the handle right there and I don't want that to happen. So I'm gonna go pretty light on these. 
And I'm going to keep digging deeper and deeper with each one of them. Until I get closer down there to the line. Pretty close to the line. Now right here, see, your instinct would be to turn around and start chopping this way, but that's going to damage. It's going to round off and, and mar up the front of your bowl and chip that off. So you don't want to do that. So I'm going to come over here and put it on the side where I'm bear bearing more back here. Watch your fingers on this cut right here. It's dangerous. Trying to get down to the line with my scores. I'm not going to be able to get a really good flow right there with the hatchet. We're going to come back with a knife and do that. I just want to get rid of most of the wood. And now. I can work back from this direction and flow out the rest of it. You don't want to keep over chopping here because you're going to split through. No when to say when right there. That is rough. Looking right there, that looks terrible. But we're going to finish that up with a uh, a knife. The hatchet's not the tool for the job right there. All right. I'm going to flow out the front here real quick. Again, your instinct is to put it right up like that. And you'll and chop from here, which would be a great place, except for you'll damage the face of that, so you can't do that. So we are going to start adding the third dimension, but before we add the third dimension, I wanted to take a little bit of time to point out the advantage of, one of the advantages of the way that we went about doing this. Now see, in, in doing one dimension at a time, we enabled ourselves to develop these sight ridges. And you are on the other side of the world seeing this from a video that's made by a phone. And so, and, and even there, you can see these sight ridges with your eye on the other side of the world. So here in, in the present, you'd be able to really, really see them. And your eye can go directly towards anything. And it just really helps you understand the layout of things much better when you go about it one dimension at a time. And it enables you to understand the layout of anything and how you could do anything in stages. And so in, uh, on YouTube, I see all the time where guys are carving spoons out of like some dried two by four or something and they have it like clamped down to their shop bench and bang bang it's just like this and they're digging the bowl out first and then they start working like just all like i don't even know and 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 uh i'll stop right there but but let me return to this when you are carving a spoon you're doing two things one is making a spoon and that can improve your life the other thing that you're doing is learning how to understand what it is you're doing and I think ultimately that brings much more value than the spoon. And if you take time to do it in stages and understand the stages, that better aids in your ability to understand the concept of learning what you're doing. And if you just go about it all one time, you know, whacking it with a hammer and whatnot, clamping it and rounding everything off, it eliminates your ability to actually visualize the steps and stages and reduces your ability to actually learn what it is you're doing. And so... That's another reason why I think it's so important to do it one dimension at a time. Excuse me for rambling. Now we'll go ahead and get on to adding the actual third dimension. Now when you add the third dimension, you kind of want to add the third dimension the same way 
that you went about it singular dimensionally earlier. I'm going to round off of the back right here, round the whole back over. And I'm going to do it in a way that enables us to maintain sight ridges. It's always important to maintain those sight ridges. Without the sight ridge, you're really only guessing at what you're doing. With the sight ridge, it really helps you be able to see what it is you're actually doing. So I'm just going to round off from one side all the way to the other. And when you maintain the sight ridge, it will directly show you how accurate your ability to create a nice flow, a nice round actually was. And I'll stop about a quarter inch before I get to the top. That's important. You always want to stop about a quarter inch from when you get to the top of the bowl there. So I'm rounding from one side all the way through to the other. And from my vantage point here, where my eye is, I can see pretty accurately what I'm trying to accomplish. So now that I've actually made my first pass, maintaining these sight ridges, let's take a look at it and see what we have. So you can see that is... A nice flow and you can see it because we still maintain these sight ridges and so we can still see our symmetry here this aids in our ability to understand the symmetry and so now we have established four quarters one two three four and and you can just see the symmetry again an advantage of establishing those sight ridges and doing things uh, systematically so okay we have that nice round over now we're going to go to this first quarter and we're going to round that over we're going to round this over so on and so forth Quarter number one. I'm going to create this dark shadow of a crease right here. I'm going to try to show you on the phone here and see if it helps in your ability to understand what it is I'm talking about. Okay, so you can see that, that shadow down in there. That shadow is what I'm using as my reference. That's my sight reference right there, that shadow. And I'm gonna walk that shadow all the way forward on this one quarter. Stopping about a quarter inch from the top. You wanna to maintain that right here, about a quarter inch from the top. back quarter right here working back towards the handle like I said earlier every step from the beginning of the process gets harder and harder and harder that's why you need to develop ways to learn what it is you're actually doing so your skills can progress as you go so when you get to the end you actually possess the skills you will need to finish the job and make it look like something worth having. So I'm working back towards the handle here, creating that same shadowy crease for my sight reference. And I'm keeping in mind, I don't want to over chop and damage my handle. So these, I kind of encourage the split to happen more than in the front. You want to go slow through here. Don't overdo it. When you get close, encourage a little split off right here. Don't overdo this cut either. You can see how close my thumb is to a dangerous spot right there. Be aware of that. If you overcut, you'll cut into the side of your handle. 
You'll damage your work. And you won't be able to recover from it. So don't overcut there. You have to make multiple attempts to go back and forth for relief cuts. That is all we're going to do there. All right, time to tune up the other side. Getting close on this. Tune up this last little detail here. Be careful with this. Don't overcut it. You'll split the bottom of your bowl off. Don't overcut this. You'll split the bottom of your handle off. Get back closer to my reference line right here. And that is, we're getting close here. Let me turn up this a little bit. But that's about as far as we're going to go with the hatchet. You can see what we've got. We've maintained all these sight ridges right here. Super important. And we're about a quarter inch right here from the top all the way around. You'll see where this comes into play in the very next step, how important it was to maintain roughly that quarter inch. If you maintained a lot more, you'll see it's a huge disadvantage in the next step. All right, let's go ahead and jump to the next step. Okay, so you can see right there that is roughly a nice round, but there's also some humps and bumps. It's not it's not a finished flow. So we're going to add our finished flow to that round right there. And that's why it's important to bring that to a quarter inch. So we only have a quarter inch to move around through there. If it was three quarters of an inch or something, that's much more wood to move at a time. And it's way harder. So to bring it to that, that quarter inch is a, is a huge advantage. So make sure to do that with the hatchet. So now we're going to work on servicing this flow all the way around to really true that up. Now when I start on this, I like to think of it in quarters also, because I like to kind of maintain a systematic understanding of what it is we're doing and not just get lost in ADD, pop it and spark and work on this. Go work on that for a little bit. Don't really like to do it that way. So kind of start and think of it as quarters here too. So I rough that out and I go back to look at it and that's actually really good. I don't need to go back over that. I'm going to flow this other quarter into it. And I want to switch knives real quick. But remember, strop often. Yeah, this is working way better. So I'm just going to flow this right around into the other side. All right. So we have, you can see that is a much better flow all the way around through there. And again, that flow is 90 degrees from the surface all the way around. And that just trued up that profile what you're looking at right there and now we're going to flow the whole back of the bowl you can see that's pretty lumpy from our hatchet so we're going to flow that out we're going to surface that whole back of the bowl out using this uh fishtail right here again strop often so 
when we go to surface out the back of this bowl, we are going to do the same thing that we did with the hatchet. Just a much more controlled version because we're using a smaller, more elegant tool. So I'm going to take this cut up and all the way over. Just like I did with the hatchet. And this is going to enable us to see our final flow as far as the roundness of the profile is concerned. When you're cutting with the chisel here, or any knife, you're never just hydraulically pushing straight forward like a bulldozer. It is a slice, a pry, and a push. It's a compound situation. That's the term carving. That's why in sailing or in surfing, we use the same term because the wave is pushing forward, the board's pushing that way. It's carving, it's a compound action. And so here we are carving, again, not with a high, not with a, you know, a, a, a barbaric, primitive, straightforward push. It's not that. It is a very advanced slice, pry, and push. That's why it's looking pretty effortless. Okay, so you can see right there, we're only concerned with the profile. And, and you can see we added that nice roundness to it. Now that we can see that with our eye, we're going to ride that same wave all the way to the front, starting one quarter at a time. I'm going to drop my tool here real quick. and start bringing this to the front on this side. Okay, we've surfaced it out all the way to the front. Now it's time to turn around and ride the same flow all the way back to the handle. This cut that I'm using here is not done with one hand it's done with two hands as you can see and that's why it looks pretty efficient when you're watching it when you try to do it it's going to be a little harder but make sure to use two hands another thing i should explain yeah this is a good time to take the time to explain that you'll see i have that much of the chisel sticking out of my hand and this part of my hand right here is my stop. So even though I'm carving towards my finger in some, in some places, not here though, because I'll stab the handle. And so as I'm pushing, I'm only taking a half inch stroke at a time because my hand is bearing right on that. So my arm is not doing the pushing. It's my hand and my wrist right here. So if I was going like this, I go wham and skip past, stab my leg, stab my hand. So I always have this stop right here and I'm only pushing with my two hands, not my whole body. And, and that's, that's what makes it safe because I can't do one of these random Boy Scout stabs. So, always have a stop when you're carving. I'll explain that more thoroughly as we get further into the video, but it's, have that stop is really important. That's what keeps you from cutting yourself. So again, as I'm carving here, you'll see that my elbow back here is hitting into my side and that is my stop. So I have control with that. I'm not just gonna do one of these and slash my side because I have this stop right there. Always have a stop when you're carving.
we're going to go about this handle kind of how we did everything else, just one quarter at a time. This is one quarter, that's one quarter, so on and so forth. And we're just adding a nice flow to the whole handle and finishing out into the back of the bowl here. This takes a little bit of doing right here, so move, move slowly through this area. Start on the other side here and flow it in. You'll see as I'm working towards the other side, I'm leaving that initial strip right there because that was my first flow. And I don't want to lose that right now. I'm gonna cut that off last for uh, uh, reasons of keeping my uh, geometric layout proper. All right, we're gonna flow out the bottom of the handle right here. You can see that's where we were hitting with the hatchet and uh, hatchet just became too big for that. So we're gonna hit it with a knife and, and give the back of this handle a proper flow. Again, back to the old North Bay. Now you can do this however you want to. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to flow it slightly round and right up the side here a little bit, but I'm going to leave that rigid sight ridge because that's going to enable anybody who picks up this spoon to see a good flow. If you were worried about the flow and it didn't look good, you could round that off and that would hide your poor job that you did on on shaping the handle but we don't want to hide the job because we're not uh unproud of it we're, we're proud of the job we did so we're going to leave that sight ridge for everyone to see and aid in their ability to see the nice flow that we accomplished That uh, looks pretty good. So we're gonna leave that nice line there to really help everyone be able to see that nice flow. All right, we've got the back of our bowl taken care of. The whole handle's taken care of. Our transition here looks nice. Time to start working on digging out the bowl. And uh, the way we're gonna start there is getting us a nice control line here. We're gonna use the old finger gauge trick here. Roughly a quarter inch. I hope you can see the line. It's black on walnut, so that's gonna be challenging for you to see. But we're gonna make a line roughly a quarter inch in from the outside. So to start digging out the bowl, the tool that we are going to use is uh, this gouge right here and we're just going to get close to the edge and just just start it with this gouge let's go ahead and get into it So now that we have taken that gouge once around to just kind of establish digging out the bowl, we're gonna to switch to this other crooked knife, this North Bay. I've got two of these. You'll see one is not as bent as the other one. And uh, I definitely recommend buying both of these. North Bay Forge, look them up online, you'll find them. I think they're about 65 bucks a knife. And they should be about $1,000 a knife because that's how much value they bring. Anyways, yeah, let's start digging this sucker out. 
So this is a really effective tool. Really good. It really just speeds up your performance and makes you so much more capable. Now, you'll probably wonder why I, I've been wearing this leather cuff right here. What this leather cuff does is that nice crisp sight ridge that we've worked so painfully to, uh, to maintain, that's really sharp and really abrasive. And if you're carving without it, 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 it wears out your, your, your wrist right there as you're, as you're carving. Now I've got this cuff on and you can see I ride right on that leather cuff as I'm prying right here. And so I can do that all day long. But if you carve all day without it, you end up getting a big blister right there and then you bleed on your work and it's terrible and miserably uncomfortable. So having a leather cuff right there is, uh, is really good. If you don't have one, no big deal. But I would still make one because they're really good. So throughout the whole process of digging the bowl out, what, what you kind of want to think about is making sure that you're maintaining a nice flow the whole time so you're practicing uh, obtaining the skill that you're going to need. If you can't get a flow at any point through the digging out the bowl process, then that would be ridiculous to think that you will be able to get a flow right whenever it matters, that final surfacing. So make sure to practice that nice flow throughout the whole thing so when you get down to where it counts, you have the skill that you need to really surface it out and uh, make it look good. All right, so we are putting the finishing touches on the inside of the bowl. And take your time and get a good even wall thickness there, somewhere roughly around a quarter inch. If it's kind of varies in thickness, that is a sign of uh, poor skill. So try to not have that. Try to have a nice even bowl thickness. All right, we're done with the inside of that bowl. We're going to start flowing out this rocker on the top right here. And uh, we're getting closer to the, to the end. So anyways. This take your time on this. This is this is a, a really important part. It's not very hard to actually do with the knife. It's just uh, to make it look right. To whenever you stand back and sight the spoon to see a really nice flow. That's where the challenge is going to come in here. So, and, and depending on what piece of wood you have, there's going to be a transition spot right in here somewhere. This one doesn't actually have it because of the way the grain is, but you'll end up digging a big hole right there. So just, just be careful. You can see I got some funny grain back here that's putting up some resistance here. Let me cite what's actually happening. Okay, that went really good. So our rocker looks really good there. And I'm gonna cite it all the way around. Let me see if I can get a, uh, can you see that? Is it focused? You want that nice flow right there, that nice nice flow all the way around. Now that you can see that flow, we're gonna get, and you can see, because we maintained this sight ridge and this interior sight ridge, you can see the symmetry all the way around. But we're gonna go ahead and flow this interior, roll it out to the outside there. This is one of the last stages of, of carving, is just rolling this out to the outside. There's that transition. You want to watch out for that. Be careful right there because you'll end up going this way and that way, this way and that way until you dig a thin spot right there. And you don't want that to happen. So. We're almost done with the carving of this spoon. The next step is to finish it. And I'll show you how we finish our spoons over on the bench. I'm not gonna finish this one because it's still a little green. I like to leave it sit around for a day or three so it can dry out. So that is That's that.
that is the spoon that we carved today. Now, I'm gonna move it around real slow so you can kind of see some of the, uh, the proper flows. I don't know if you can really get a good sight down that ridge right there. That really enables you to see some of that nice graceful flow that we accomplished. So on and so forth around the other side there. That nice rocker to the bowl. Good flow to the handle. So that's that. Uh, we're not going to finish this spoon today as far as the finish goes because we're going to let it dry. But I'm going to take you over here to the bench and I'm going to show you how we finish our spoons and what we use to do that with. Let's go take a look. So this is the spoon we carved today. We're not going to finish this one today, but I wanted to take time to show you how we take the spoon from this stage to actually done. Uh, this one was carved green like we talked earlier, so we're going to set that down and let it dry a little bit. And it'll only need a couple of days. So there is this silly rule in the wood carving world that you'll hear all the time. How long does it take a piece of wood to dry? Well, roughly about an inch a year. And that is a great rule that means absolutely nothing because a, 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 a log or a piece of wood in log form will almost never dry because it takes so long to air for air to get to the middle. Now, once you carve this spoon from green wood into this shape, that, that bowl is a quarter inch, so it's only going to take a few days to dry out. And this handle is so thin, it, again, is only going to take a few days to dry out. So that's how long it will take this to dry out, a few days, depending on the weather outside. If it's really rainy and humid, you understand what I'm saying, or really hot, so blah, blah, blah. Let's pick up one of these spoons we carved a few days ago. This one's already dry. You can hear it. It's just crisp and rigid. And, uh, and really dry. So we're gonna finish this one off. How I finish the spoon off is I have a piece of 220 sandpaper that I use. And I'm not actually sanding it. I don't wanna sand the tool marks out of it. That's not what we're here to do. We just kinda wanna soften it a little bit. So I'm just gonna lightly go over it. And uh, I just want, I don't wanna take the tool marks because you wanna be able to see that it's hand done. So I'm just gonna barely go over and soften it just a little bit. It's more of like an aging rather than a sanding. So you can see I haven't hit those ridges yet. I wanna save those ridges to last and then I wanna roll them just a little bit to, to again, to aid in that proper flow because that's what you're gonna see. And uh, so I'll just go over it real fast here. Just enough to kind of soften the edges. Not too much sanding. You can still see all of the tool marks. Make sure to get down the bottom. Finish off the outside here. You want to be pretty systematic when you're doing it and sanding the spoon or finishing the spoon like this, you really can destroy the spoon and make it look really bad. You'll notice as I'm sanding, I'm not rounding over that edge. I'm keeping that edge crisp until the last thing that I do will be to properly flow that edge in the final step of trying to preserve that, that nice sight ridge. So now I'm gonna barely just roll that edge right around through there, just enough. But you can still see it's pretty crisp. And your eye goes right to that outer edge. So that's as much sanding as we're gonna do. Now I'm gonna put the finish on it. The finish that we use is the finish that we make. It has beeswax, carnauba wax, walnut oil, and lemon essential oil in it. And this is the texture of it. And it's really hot out today. It's probably working on 90 degrees. And even in 90 degrees, this is as soft as it is. If it's colder, it's a little bit harder. So the wax creates a nice rigid, you know, crisp surface and, and the oil soaks in to preserve the wood. A little bit goes a long ways. You dig a little bit out. If you don't have any of this, which I'm sure you won't have any, you can just use olive oil. To finish your spoon up and that's that's a good safe food safe finish i don't recommend using mineral oil 
but that will be up to you. You can use whatever you want. Olive oil works great. You don't have to feel bad about eating it. This, this what we have here works great. You don't have to feel bad about putting it in your food. And uh, when you're finishing out a whole bunch of spoons, your hands will get pretty oily and you want to have like a cotton cloth by nearby that you can uh, kind of wipe the oily feel of the spoon off. But we're not going to worry about that today because I didn't put too much on there and it's just kind of rubbing in really nicely. So that is what a finish product looks like. That is the finish that we put on all our bowls and our spoons that we make. And that's it. This sucker is ready to go in a pot of beans or soup or whatever you want to use it for. Ready to go. That's the pretty much the finished product right there. So I hope you enjoyed watching this video. In a video like this, it's kind of challenging to make. There is way more to explain than I was able to explain in this short period of time, even though the short period of time ended up being painfully long. It's still not long enough to explain all there is to explain. So anyways, apologize for the length of the video. Hope it brought you some value, and thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.